we live. There we are. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Washington. I am the National New Play Network producer in residency at Actors Express. And for an image description, I am a short African American woman with a blue wrap around my head. And I am wearing purple glasses, had to think about the color, with a whitish background behind me. And welcome to Raising the Curtain. Raising the Curtain is a reminder of all the promises that theaters, specifically one of them being Actors Express, made almost a year ago to do better in equity, diversity, and inclusion. So this is like a living diary of how we're moving forward to making things better for our industry in every category possible. Tonight we have family and theater. So balancing a career in theater can be very difficult. Having a family on top of that I have yet to find out how that looks, but I know it is not an easy path to take. So tonight we have conversations from working artists in the industry who also happen to be guardians and parents. So who would like to start us out with introduction? I think that's supposed to be me. Hello. <laughs> I'm Arielle Fisto. I'm the founder and artistic director of the New York Times award-winning Out of Hand Theater here in Atlanta. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, and I am a mom and a foster mom. I can keep going, but... <laughs> you, Eugene, I think that's you. <laughs> cool. I'm... Um... Eugene H. Russell IV in my actor world, Eugene IV in my music world, um, actor, musician, composer, ATL born and raised, still here. Um, and um, yeah, I am um, I also have a company called Men Not Myths, and it's a line of fatherhood tees and hoodies that uh, more specifically celebrates Black fathers and uplifts and celebrates Black fatherhood. So I'm uh, proud of that. And I got two beautiful baby girls. I got a wife, you know, I always leave her out when I start, you know, gushing over my baby girls. Um, two beautiful baby girls, seven and five years old. Mm, all right. Mahalia, it's okay. It's okay. Life happens. <laughs> Hence why we're here to talk about it. Life happens. Oh, goodness. Hello, everyone. I am Mahalia Jackson. I am first and foremost, a musical theater actress and singer. I'm also a pianist. Uh, I uh, serve as an audition pianist, a uh, musical director. I am a piano teacher, a lyricist. I write music. I write songs. I am also a homeschooling mom. And I run a little home-based business called Road Scholar Mom, where I do some homeschool consulting. Also on the side, a, a jack of all trades and a master of none, I guess you could call me. Um, trying to hold this thing together, being an, art, an artist and a working mom as well in the arts world. I am a mom of four uh, and also have a surrogate daughter. So I call them my fab four plus one more. So um, three of them are grown. One of them thinks she's grown at 15. And then my surrogate daughter, she's 32, but uh, she doesn't always act 32. So uh, being a mom of three grown kids and a teenager, they always keep it interesting. So there's my brood and that's my mood. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> cool. So let's get into these questions because I feel as if y'all got a lot to say and I am ready to hear about it. All right. Okay. So first. How do you think the, in, the theater industry work environment can start making practicing theater more accessible to parents or guardians? I'll <laughs> jump in there. Yeah, I was going to say, so we can, if y'all want to, we can answer this in short spurts, right? So I'll throw the first thing out there. 
Um, I have to be careful about being so like apologetic about how I feel about things before I even say it. So I'm gonna just say it and then I'll explain it. Um, one of the things I think is to where possible, pay more money. Um, mm. I know, I know that can be easier said than done. You know what I mean? But a lot of people that are artists become parents and, and go get like me down nine to five Monday through Friday gigs. Cause they just don't make enough in their art. So again, you know, uh, there are many theaters that are doing the absolute best that they can, you know, and I get that it's easier said than done, but the, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't throw that out there. Mm -hmm. I got a couple other answers to that. That's my first part. So I'll let somebody else jump in. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, Eugene. I know that one of the challenges um, with theater, not just theater, the arts, but I'm going to stick to theater right now in being a parent. When you are working, uh, on a show and you're a mom and um, the show's pay is standard middle of the line with theater, it's not enough. And so you are going to pick up other jobs to supplement. What does that cause? It causes you to be away from your kids even more, but theater is your main thing. Um, it's not gonna sustain you and then Theater people often pick up other jobs, but you have kids at home. They're your other job. They're the full-time job. They're the job that you never, you know, you never clock out of. So you have theater, which is a job that, um, theater's a job that when you leave the theater, that job isn't over either because you have study, mm -hmm. you have character development, you have all these things that you're going to work on when you're outside of the theater. So you're working on that when you're away from the theater. Then you have this other job that you're trying to supplement the theater income outside of the theater. Then you have these children that you're responsible for outside of the theater. Do, do you see where I'm going with this? It's a lot. It's too much. But the pay's not too much. So if a theater company would pay the, the, the pay would increase and we're not having to pick up other jobs, other odds and then, you know, other gigs, other things on the side, that makes it way more accessible for families, for people like us who have families to support, where that's just the one thing that we're doing. So thank you, Eugene, for the elephant that was in the room. That's the first thing that they could do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to add on to that. Um, and I, I definitely agree with what Eugene and Mahalia are saying. But um, beyond that, I think that theaters can think outside the box a little bit more in terms of what programming looks like and come up with more kinds of programming that don't require parents to be gone six nights a week for two months in a row and you know when their their kids are in the, the, what, the only time that their kids are at home you know and only be home when their kids are at school i think that that can be really tricky and i know that that is one of the things me as an artistic director and on the arts administration side to go okay what else you know what what other models can i invent um, and so that's, I mean, that's, you know, made us develop shows in homes where we can have limited runs or we can have multiple actors who play the same role and switch in and out or have monthly events where it's one thing that happens every month, like equitable dinners, um, just to think about how can, how can artists still pursue their art, but also be good parents, you know, be responsible to those parents and feel like they're not missing their, their children's childhood like they're not missing out on that stuff and I think that that at the same time you know and, and I, I want to acknowledge that that is um, much easier for me to say than for most arts administrators because I don't run a venue and I it's a whole other world that Actors Express is dealing with and and all of the theater companies in town who have a venue and so they feel like they have to produce a traditional season outside of COVID and have you know a certain number of shows and a certain number of performances in order to make ends meet um, but I hope that in the future more companies can think flexibly about what programming looks like and what schedules look like 
um, for lots of reasons. And parents is a really great reason, but also be, so that we can serve more kinds of audiences, you know, serve people who don't feel comfortable buying a ticket or, or maybe can't afford to buy a ticket to a traditional theater event and then also pay for childcare and transportation and, you know, maybe get to go out to dinner and whatever. And I mean, it's, it's a, it's a big commitment for a lot of people to, to go to traditional theater. And I think a lot of people just feel excluded from it anyway, like it's not for them. So how is, can we as theater artists and theater administrators think outside the box in terms of what programming looks like and how it can serve audiences and artists and our whole community better? Mm -hmm. yes, I, I, oh, go ahead. No, go, 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 go. I, I do want to say this. Um, as a parent, uh, children are unpredictable and need uh, perpetual flexibility. And I know that um, directors, artistic directors, all the powers that be, I have been fortunate in, in most of the companies that I've worked for. Uh, it starts with a mentality and a philosophy at the top with the people that you're working with and a vibe, a spirit. So if you get the vibe that there's this firewall or that there's this staunchness with the people that you're working with, with their mentality, or if you get a vibe that, well, none of these people are parents, so I know they're not gonna be flexible or understanding or sensitive to the plight of a parent, you're not going to feel compelled to go to them and say, okay, I understand rehearsal isn't over till 11, and I understand that it is 9, 12 right now, but I just got a text that my kid is running 100 temperature, and I need to go. So I said all that to say, it begins with a mentality from the top. If the top has given you the sense of where there is a familial spirit here, we are understanding, we we feel you, we're here with you. Yes, we have a show to put on. Yes, there's a job to do. Yes, we we have set this intent and we know what needs to happen. But we also know that you have a life to live and you have these kids and they are human beings and you are not beholden to us and those kids can die all we care. Like if that is not the spirit that is coming from the top, if it is the opposite of that, if they are understanding and human and the human spirit bleeds through them and that has been conveyed to the cast and crew from the beginning. Many times that can be the spirit, but that has not been conveyed to the cast. And I know a lot of younger people coming in, they're terrified to ask anything outside of the norm. Ooh, is it okay if I leave early? Oh, my baby is sick. Or, you know, I, I do need to leave early and pick her up. They're afraid to ask, afraid they'll get fired, afraid they'll get a bad reputation. Afraid, you know, they're they're just fearful or or they they've heard things about. So if that mm -hmm. mentality has been relayed clearly, precisely from the beginning. If it's there, and if it's not there, it needs to be there. So I think that that sense of understanding and sensitivity to the plight of a parent needs to be in place. If it's not in place, and if it is in place, it needs to be communicated clearly from the get-go, from the first cast meeting. It needs to be communicated to the cast that this is in place for you. All you need to do is let us know. And of course, we'll be understanding to you and your plight and whatever you need to, you know, we're here to serve you with, you need to leave early for your child or whatever, you know, go ahead and feel free to do that in good faith. Yeah. I was just going to say real quick. Yeah. Ariel set it off with the buzzword flexibility. Yeah. I'd say, I'd yeah. say yeah. Um, flexible scheduling and casting. I want to throw that out there. Get under studies when you can get under studies Please. because that's less, first of all, it's only in your best interest. As a, as a company, as an entity, as producers, right? Because you're covered. And also it takes the pressure off of parents who might have that sick child at home. And it's like, man, but I don't want to let my cast down. I need to leave rehearsal early, but because my child's really sick. 
and I don't want to not be there with my really sick child, but I don't have an understudy. So it's really going to mess up rehearsal. So again, I know that's a financial thing and some of that stuff is easier said than done, but while we putting it out there, you know, where possible get understudies, you know, so, so a parent, mm -hmm. and I know non-parents have other emergencies too, that they could use understudies for, but since we're on the topic of, you know, uh, since we talk about us being parents, there are a lot of parental emergencies, you know what I'm saying? Um, hopefully not a ton of them, but there are parental emergencies. And when you don't have an understudy, you may just suffer in silence because you, yeah. you're trying to be a team player. And that's not good for your, your mental health. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So theaters openly communicating, saying, hey, we support you. Whatever you need, let us know. I heard this one thought about, and once again, I have not had the blessing yet of becoming a parent. That's later down the road for me, uh, but about the thought of having daycares installed in actual theaters. What do you all think of that? Love the idea. Like for the rehearsal process, or maybe while, if you're on the administration side, when you're working, is that a thought you all would entertain? I know it's maybe a little scary to drop your off, drop your kids off, even though we go to school, but drop your kids off and leave them while you go pretend to be someone else. Well, I, I, I can speak from a little bit of experience being a, a, I was a theater major in college and also a mother in college. So I had two small children while going to college as a theater major, starring Woo. in the musicals every spring with a baby. So I, I have a little bit of experience with this, uh, doing the whiz, passing my child off on the side of the stage having freshly breastfed, getting ready to do a thing. So, uh, it was amazing to it, it sort of, sort of have childcare right there. You know, I, I had the Winkies from the Wiz holding my kid. Okay. So they were my childcare. Um, it was amazing to have my cast members surround me and be her village. Her is my 25 year old daughter now who was cared for by my whiz cat. Um, it was amazing to have that right there because I could then focus, but my kid was right there. So the distraction, the worry, the, you know, think my mind was not somewhere else. My mind was fully in house. And we know as actors, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all up here. It's heart and it's head. And everything was right there in the theater because my heart was with my kid and my heart was also on the stage and everything was housed right there in the building. So theater companies may want to think about that because, you know, you want Effie's head in the building. And if Effie's kid is in the building, her head's going to be there too. Her heart's going to be there too. Cause everything that's most important to Effie is right there. So, logistics how that's going to work yeah let let all the smart people figure that out but you know that's going to benefit everybody in the long run because look you know the box office manager's kid is going to be in that daycare too so you know this this behooves everyone in the equation not just you know the cast members it, this this helps everybody from the staff the cast the crew you know so on-site daycare, and there have been studies that on-site daycare boosts morale. It's a money saver. It, it, you know, this, this tax breaks, you know, so <laughs> this is, this is a, a good thing for everybody. Um, in, in every part of the equation, it's a good business decision. It's good morally. It, it, it it's a plus for everybody. So look at me trying, trying to tell Freddie to get a good, <laughs> Get a get an on-site daycare <laughs> at Access Express, but yeah, I think that that nothing. There is no downside to having on-site daycare for for members of any organization like that. That that could only be a plus. And it's good for the. I mean, it's it's good. It's good for the theaters too. Uh oh, did I do something weird? Am I good? I mean, it's good for the it's good it's good for the theater too because now you've 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 uh, expanded your talent pool, right? Oh, so absolutely. maybe there's this dope you know actor that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to hire but now you got on-site on-site daycare so they're like oh i'm in i can do it you know and i i just want to take a quick second to shout out the atlanta theater community 
anybody that's done a show with me since I've become a parent can probably recall at least one good rehearsal where one of my babies or both of my babies was there. And yeah. I don't mean just there, like they might be on stage if you turn, yeah. you know, if you, if you ain't watching, but everybody was so, the cast was so loving and caring. And I got to shout out Aurora Theater too, because I, I, and and uh, Freddie, I'm sure y'all would be this way for me at Actors Express. Uh, but I know Aurora, we literally, uh, when Naeem and I were doing Memphis the Musical, we only had one kid, then we had uh, Eliana. Um, and their, their, uh, their, um, um, uh, box office folks pretty much served as the as the as the babysitting service. It was amazing. <laughs> they watched that baby while we were on stage anytime because Naima had a lead role. So you know, I took more of the watch the baby thing because I could afford to have my attention split a little more. So anytime I was between scenes, I'd run and check on her. Um, you know, as much as I could, I'd peek my head and you know, kind of through the lobby door and see what she was. And they were so good with her. And then at uh, intermission, um, you know, I, I you know, I. I brought her in there with me and uh, she ended up falling asleep and slept through the second act in the in the stroller in the dressing room. We got off the stage for the finale, came back to the dressing room. That baby's still asleep. But there was somebody keeping an eye on her. So I said all that to say, you know, you know, um, producers and theater runners, you know, uh, don't think that cast members would have an issue with babies even being in the building. Because like I said, I just gave you one of many examples where our babies were not only in the building, but literally in the rehearsal room. Yeah. And everybody was totally cool with it. Now, I'm not saying let them in the rehearsal room, you know what I'm saying? Because that could get tricky if it's a bunch of them. But my point is, you know, there are people that want this, you know, that would totally be on board and support this. And there are people that need this, you know. And I know we wanted to do it uh, like, you know, it's easier to do before they can walk. So, like, <laughs> my best friend and I um, and my managing director and I both had the experience of, when we had babies who couldn't get up and walk around yet of like lots and lots of meetings and, you know, site visits with foundations for <laughs> grants and whatever, where we're carrying the baby in the bucket or there's, you know, their baby in, in a stroller or whatever. And I mean, lots of um, breastfeeding and pumping during 10 minute breaks and trying to get back to, you know, like I'm directing, I'm back after 10 minutes, but I just, you know, pumped to press <laughs> baby. Well, I'm gonna see it eleven o'clock tonight. Um, but it but I we it does get trickier once they can walk. So, you know, and I I, I you know and Kristen Silton, who was at Actors Express um I, until not so long ago, uh, is and is now on my board of directors. I her she works at the, the Alliance right now, and I don't know, but I suspect that the Alliance is the only company in town that has the resources to do this. But I know like her kids get to go to summer camp at the Alliance mm -hmm. for free as a job perk, and like I wish that. I mean, I, like I said, I don't even run a venue, so there is nowhere for me to have a child care center. <laughs> like there's no building, mm -hmm. but um. I wish that we could all offer it or, you know, if, if all the Atlanta theaters got together and offered it, that would be amazing. But then of course it wouldn't be on site. Like Mahalia was saying, it wouldn't necessarily, you know, if it, depending on how many parents there were who were in shows at any one time, if all the kids went to a central location, it might not be where you were. So I don't know that that would help that much. I mean, I, I think of, um, and yeah, Ariel, I'm thinking, cause I know Sheldon put that in the chat too, saying, thinking about smaller theaters who can't afford accommodations such as daycare and more pay. I mean, yeah, that's a tricky one because again, like you were saying, Ariel, once they start walking, you know, you don't want to just say, okay, everybody with kids, bring them in, in the rehearsal. Yeah. rehearsal. I, I was just fortunate that, you know, some of those casts, I was the only one with little kids like that or whatnot. And, you know, the cast was, was big enough and people were so sweet that when I was on stage, they were literally like keeping them busy and playing with them and stuff. That ain't gonna be the situation everywhere. So I don't know, I can't even lie and pretend I have the answer to that for smaller yeah. theaters. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know what would help is if anything even close to that was allowed, it would absolutely start up top. It would be, you know, have to be made clear, you know, from stage management, you know, producers, everybody say, hey, listen, there are people with kids every now and then, you might see a kid, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know, I know that, uh, like I said, this began for me back in college. So I, I, I've i been in this practice for 27 years, having a kid in theater. And I know the biggest thing with me, with personally was established, I had to have a village. I had to have a support, a village, a support system. And, you know, being in the college, uh, 
arena with this, my friends who were theater people too, you know, I had a little circle and I could not have made it without that close knit circle of about four good friends. And they are still in my kids who are grown. They are still in those kids lives today. That core set of friends, that village. When my daughter gets married in, in about two years, that four set of friends will be on that front pew. One, you know, they, they, you have to have that support system. You have to have that core group of people. You, you just, it, it, it is imperative that as a parent, you, you know, Eugene, you can speak on this. Aria, you can speak on this. You have to have a support system. You have to have a person, people that you can just lean on, count on that somebody you can call. Yeah, you have your spouse. Yeah, you have grandma and grandpa, but there's got to be a person or people, a couple, a, a aunt, a grandma, a neighbor, or somebody. You have to have a support system that you can count on, rely on, that, that is there. If you're in theater, you got to have help because you're going to have mishaps. You're going to have rehearsals that run, run long. You're going to have a director that calls an extra rehearsal. You're going you're gonna to have things. A support system is crucial in this business if you're going to be a parent uh, and do it. So, um, for young parents, parents who are just starting out, or you're the, a parent who's going to get into theater, or you are just had a little baby and you're going to think about establish that village, definitely. When, when I get young girls who talk to me and ask me, you know, how do you do it? That's the first, how did you do it? That's the first thing I tell them, honey, establish you a system, a network, a group of people that, that are in you and your child's life that you trust, trust is key, that you trust, that you trust with your life and your child's life that you can count on when the chips are down, no fair weather people, that you can trust and, and count on to have your back, have your child's back, your village. So um, that's key. And then working for reputable, good, theater companies that are going to support you and be there, you know, with you, for you, work with you in your situation as a parent. That's key um, because if they're not going to be understanding and work with you and, and be flexible and understanding of your situation, it's not going to work either. So, um, and what uh, Sheldon MBA was saying with the smaller theater companies, like you just said, I don't have the, that, that's a rough one. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. We got to put our head together with that one and, and try to come up with, with uh, working alternatives because that is a conundrum um, when they don't have the resources for on-site uh, childcare or to call somebody in to help. Um, and casts that are, that are band together and help um, the helping spirit, the community spirit, um, you know, that that is integral in, in this thing. If you have a cast members that are, you know, parents, you, if you have people who are adamantly against a child being in the, th you know, that that that's not that's not an attitude that's going to lend itself to a cast member that's a parent. You know, everybody has to have the understanding spirit. It has to be a group effort. It it, it has to be. If if anybody is going to not be a team player with a cast member that's a parent, it's just not going to work. That's, that, that leads me to one of the next questions of, so for parents who are just starting out to for being parents or guardians, what advice do you give them when it comes to contracts of like, this is what I need and this is what I have to have in order to do this show. What, what are some of the advices? I know, Mahalia, you gave a little bit to it, but um, Ariel or Eugene, do you want to add on? Or Mahalia, do you want to add on to what you said? 
definitely decide first and foremost what you will and won't tolerate. You have to make a decision in your head. What what is a deal breaker? Yeah, what's negotiable and what's not negotiable for you? So I know the first thing when I got to Atlanta from college as a mom, I made up in my mind what I would and would not do and wouldn't do as a parent. So if there was a theater company that would not let me leave, if something was going on with my kid, I couldn't take the role. No matter how badly I wanted the role, no matter how badly I needed the money, if they can't work with me when it comes to my kid, that's a deal breaker. So, but that's gonna be, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna change from person to person. So what is good for me is not going to work for Ariel. It's not going to work for Eugene. So I can't judge what what's a deal breaker for me is not going to be a deal breaker for Eugene. What works for the Jacksons is not going to work for the Russells. So it's on a case by case basis. So decide for you what's a deal breaker for you and what's not. And I think making that decision and being firm and, and stand your ground and your convictions, I think that will serve you well in making those decisions. What's your priority and what is not negotiable for you and make that decision first will lead you and serve you well. Yeah, I, I say um, really before you, really even before you audition for a show, really consider and know what the time commitment is and what the minimum is. Mm. And if considering your commitments to your family and what your family needs from you and what your family needs, if you know that that's time that you can't give, especially for that pay, then I say you can nip a lot of that in the bud by just, you know, passing on the audition. I know that sounds, and I'm not saying that you won't be able to do any shows once you become a parent. Um, my wife and I are fortunate that my dad is, is, I lost my mom in 09, but my dad lives in Atlanta and both of her parents live in Atlanta. So we were fortunate, you know, that we've got, you know, people that can help, you know, watch the kids. Um, but if you don't happen to have that, and even if you say, OK, the time commitment is doable, uh, the pay is doable, just make sure you're very clear and that there are going to be no surprises when it comes to the time commitment. <laughs> um, I, that's the biggest thing I would say. And any other advice I would give to, to you said new parents. Am I right, Amanda? Look, if you have advice for parents who have been doing this for a while, no, you can I mean, in there too. Yeah, no, 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 mainly new parents. Uh, be encouraged. Yeah. Don't feel like you got to give up your career. Yes, it's yeah. challenging. Um, again, I know it's easier for me to say because we've got family in town. Um, but be encouraged. Know that you don't have to just give it all up, but just remember why you're doing what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like, Again, and I keep just connecting it to time and money, because for me, when it comes to my family and me doing a show with somebody, those are the two biggest factors. What is the time commitment and how much am I going to get paid? So don't be I guess I'm saying don't be bashful about it. Don't be apologetic about it. You know, un un understand who needs you, you know, and, and why they need you and communicate accordingly. I'd like to just step back even a little further than that, just for a sec. Um, so in my day job, I run out of hand theater as the artistic director, but my side job is that I teach arts administration and arts management at Emory. And so I spent a lot of time with college students, business school students and art students. And I, I really try to encourage them. And now because of having worked with them for so long, I try to encourage young artists who, who already are parents or who are not parents yet to seriously consider having a job in arts administration. Like, because pe what people don't real, you know, nobody ever talked to me about this when I was young and I totally fell into it, you know, without any real preparation, <laughs> like had to make it up as I went along and learn on the job. And that if you love the theater and you're committed to the theater, it may be a great, 
preparing for you to have a part-time job or a full-time job, but maybe just a part-time job doing something like marketing or fundraising or production management or, or something for a company that you love and that that can be a great thing to pair with making your art, with the work that you do as an artist. So I think that's one thing to consider. It just breaks my heart when I see really talented actors and actresses you know, who've been honing their craft and, and, and working for years and years and years. And, um, you know, and, and our SAT tutors or catering assistants or whatever, unless they like doing that, unless it's a great break for them, because for some people it is, but if they hate doing it and they have to do it either, then I, I just think like theater artists are some of the smartest and hardest working and most interesting and creative people I've ever met. And I know I'm biased, but I still believe it's true. And I think that some of that skill could be put to really great use in helping to reinvent theater as a form and reinvent what the American theater looks like and how it operates. And I, I would love to see some of that happen. So if there are any like young theater artists out there, um, please at least give it, give it a consideration. <laughs> And then, you know, for and then also for artists who are considering what projects to take, you know, what acting work to take or or also perhaps what projects they might want to self produce. They want, might want to come up with on your own. Uh, think about how you can use your skills as an artist to earn money. I mean, it's, I think so. we're so used to, to earning so little money and we're so used to, I don't know, feel like feeling like that's okay. And I just think that that's totally wrong. And that's, you know, that's how I approach my job at Out of Hand. And I didn't always, but for the past 10, 15 years at Out of Hand, I've, that's, I've really been focusing on that of like, and because of that, we make most of our money in earned income that is not ticket sales. You know, we give away most of our programs for free. And then we have clients like Coca-Cola and BlackRock and Bain who play, and you know, with the Home Depot we're doing a project for right now, who pay corporate prices so that we are able to pay our artists decently and pay ourselves decently. And I would love to just to see even more of that happen in the future. And, and to like, I would like the phrase starving artists to be wiped from our vocabulary for that not to be a thing anymore. <laughs> That's good stuff, Aria. She always makes me want to like chime in on what she just because you make me think about other stuff. You know what I mean? But you you had me thinking, and and I think that's it, Aria. Uh, to young parents, I would say because I've talked enough about all oh, what the theater pays. You know what I mean? And that's a conversation to be had. But in, separate from that, yeah, Aria, like young parent artists, yes, think outside the box. You know what I mean? Like it's not over for you just because now because you got a kid, you can't do as much on stage theater as you used to. It's okay. There, there are other avenues, especially with this past year has taught us, like there are not on stage things to be done that you can do. So I, I'd say be encouraged, think outside of the box. Life isn't over because you can't hit the stage of theaters as much as you used to. There are still other things that you can do with that that brilliance and those skills, and you'll find them. Just keep you know keep searching for them. Talk to some some other uh, uh, artist parents. You know what I'm saying? They may like, yo, I got into this thing. I do this thing, uh, mock trial stuff. You know, they hire me as an actor for lawyer training, or you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you do get an offer that you really want to do and you go do a play, also, I, I mean, also d don't apologize for that. And I mean, I, I think it's also so important for us to teach our kids that that we too and that pursuing, pursuing your dreams. And yeah, I mean, the three of us, we don't want to miss every night of our kids' lives. And that's why we're choosy about what art, artistic projects we do. But also, I think it's so important to show your kids that like, I'm an artist and this is important to me. So mommy's not going to be yeah. around, you know, but, but mommy will be back in six weeks and I, we'll figure it out. Like we'll make time on the weekends and make stuff special because I have a, a passion and a career too. So that's important too. <laughs> and that helps them that helps them respect acting as a job too. Cause you know, I tell my babies as much as I can help it instead of saying, um, daddy's going to rehearsal or daddy's got a gig, I say daddy's going to work. 
Here it is. You know, because I, I want yes. them to grow up with the mentality that, yes, I can have, I can be an artist working a job. And of course, they say if it's something you love, you never work in. You know what I mean? But I, I still want my, my babies to grow up with that respect of what it is to be a working artist. It's like, no, this is my dad's job. He's going to work. Yeah, he has fun at work, you know, but he misses us. But he's working because that's a passion he has and because we like having lights and we like heat in the winter and and ac in the summer <laughs> you know so i, I, I try to, you know sometimes i say i'm going to a gig you know but i kind of have the time you know i just say yes daddy's going to work you know i think that um helps me to bring up the a point of advice that i wanted to say you definitely have to communicate with your family about the commitment mm. of time that shows are. And I think all four of my kids are artists. They all play instruments, they sing, they, they're either something or another. But they all have the utmost respect for the arts because they understand the time commitment. Because since they were little, they have seen and understood the amount of time that mom had to commit to what she did because I was always up front with them. Look, all these hours that mom is in the theater and they were there in the theater sometime with me seeing it. And then when I met, met my future husband and, and was married and stuff and they would hear the talks that he and I would have about scheduling and things. And I was very clear and upfront with him about the time commitment that this theater thing was going to take. So my advice to young couples and young parents, be upfront, clear and precise with your family, your partner, your spouse about the time commitment that this show is going to take. And not just the show, about your at home time you're going to need, studying script, analyzing script, working on your character development, all the time that it's going to take for you to do what you do. Be upfront with them, be open with them about the commitment that it's going to take so that they can be one, knowledgeable, respectful of what you do and how you're going to have to do it, what it looks like for you to have to do what you're, what, what you're going to be doing at home, what it's going to take from you, what it take, what it takes out of you, all those things. Be honest with your family about the commitment. That it's and it's not just the commitment from you. It's going to take a commitment from your whole family. They they have to they have to give of themselves too because you're going to be too tired to cook sometimes. You're going to be too tired to play sometimes. You're going to be too tired to give husband the attention that he needs sometimes. So they're going to have to be understanding and sensitive to what you're doing too. So be honest with them about the commitment of time and energy that it's going to take. For you to do this thing called theater. That's another piece of advice that I kind of had to learn once I got married um, to do. And I think okay, you I, just Gina, want to I don't I'm not I'm, I'm not sure what your husband does, Mahalia, but I know that I think Eugene and I definitely have both like um, built our marriages on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that principle yeah. of like, okay, now it's your turn. Now it's my yeah. turn. I remember the, the hardest one for me was um, just a few years ago when, so my, my husband is Adam Fristow, who's appeared in, in several shows at Actors Express and taught in the intern program for many years. And now he's a full-time professor and rarely has time to do stuff like that anymore. And, you know, mostly when he acts himself, now it's film and TV. But just a few years ago, he worked on a series for Dolly Parton for six months where he was basically on this, he was the dialect coach. So it was the first time when he wasn't on the actor schedule, he was on the cruise schedule. Oh, and wow. It was brutal. I, I mean, know, he, that's brutal. Six <laughs> months? I mean, he was gone for 12 hey. plus hours a day, five days a week, you know, and it would start early Monday morning, but by Friday it would be like late, 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 you know, or it, Friday night early into Saturday morning. And by the end I was like, wow, this makes theater look easy <laughs> this is horrible <laughs> yeah so, I, I do have yeah to it's the give and take my, yeah oh yeah 
<laughs> it's a give and take. I do have to mention my apologies for not having anyone directly from design or production and crew on this panel. It completely slipped my mind until one of uh, one of the people at Actors Express brought it up, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, yes, they're correct." But designers, when it comes to tech, they are definitely there longer oh, yeah. than the actors. Oh, yeah. I know I have left my t uh, designers and technicians there as a director. I'm like, "Y'all, I got to go." <laughs> you will see me at a yeah. nice nine a.m. Yeah. when the sun is in the sky. But they're yeah. definitely there longer in other certain circumstances. So just navigating that. And so next time when we do this, I will make sure that side of theater is properly represented. Um. Okay. This gets into like a little dicey because it's a, it's a it's slightly a form of discrimination if anyone ever admits that they didn't hire you because you have a family. Do you tell people right away, like on the audition sheet, I have a family? Is that something you you immediately express or once you get your contract, it's like, so my pay needs to be higher to accommodate daycare. <laughs> it also needs to be a, a higher to accommodate this. When how and when yeah. are we letting theaters know that or that's is it quick, yeah that's yeah. a quick answer quick answer for me so uh no i don't i don't i don't put it on the audition sheet or anything <laughs> uh, because i well you know i i think actors have a hard time telling people no right and i i i well i can't speak for all actors i i know for me you know i i have a hard time telling people no like i don't know you know especially if they offering me something you know it's tough for me to say you know i appreciate it but i can't like that's just hard for me so so to be honest amanda um i'm just from and again i can't speak for everybody else and 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 how many kids they got or how old their kids are or where they are in their careers i'm just more selective in terms of what auditions i take so mm -hmm. if i take the audition then i know what i'll make at the very at the very least is that least you know in the ballpark of what i need to support my family right. so by the time i get to the point of i'm filling out the audition information form then i've already done the research and know which a theater pays or maybe they don't pay in the ballpark of what i need to support my family but i know i got some other stuff going so i can afford to do this show right now you know what i mean so mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me all that stuff is kind of worked out in this brain of mine before i even accept the audition and for me uh I, I am very cautious about that, particularly because I am always trying to mentor young mothers. I never want young mothers to get caught up in the vicious cycle that I got caught up in. Being a mother doesn't make you a woman. So I never want to put, you know, I don't want to be a mom who acts. I am a woman who acts. So being a mom doesn't define me. I am a, a woman who happens to be a mother. I am not a mother who's a woman. So no, I don't put on my audition seat, hey, I'm a mom. No, 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 I am a woman who happens to have had children. So no, you don't, you don't allow the fact that you birthed some children to define who you are. Being a mom doesn't define me. So I go into an audition as Mahalia Jackson, the actress. That's what you go into the audition as, the beautiful woman that you are who can act, who can do this, this art form. And then after you bag it, after they want you, that's when you start to, okay, now let me, let me, let me drop this little knowledge on you. I have these babies at home and you need me to do your little show. So this is where I need y'all to work with me on this little thing. That's when you go divulging all that information to them. Okay, so on Tuesdays, my baby has ballet. So I need to be that 8.30 thicker. That's when you, no, you don't, you get that. Now, that's my opinion. You you don't start telling them at, at the rip. So then they can be like, oh, that little one, one number 117, she got kids. We don't want to cast her. Yeah, you don't want to count yourself out. You know, you, you know, so you don't want to give them reason to, to, to you know, you don't want to give you strikes against yourself, you know, even though that type of thing is against the law. But you, you know, it's against the law. you are just, you are, everybody's the same. So no, don't, don't, don't put that and know your stuff before you go in. Know yeah. how much the pay is. Know, yeah. you know, know the time period, know the commitment. 
know everything before you go in and know if it fits into your lifestyle before you audition. You should never go into anything blind. Know how this fits into you and your child and your partner's schedule and if this can mesh with your lifestyle before you even go. So definitely don't put, you know, up under the address and I have two kids. Yeah, don't do that. But you still say something to tell you that got me thinking. Um, know, know what your non-negotiable conflicts are. So it's in connection to what you were saying, Amanda, in terms of like what you go into the filling out the audition form, you know, uh, part with. Know what your non-negotiable conflicts are, you know. And even if you're not announcing that you have kids, know what your non-negotiable conflicts are. And don't apologize to yourself or anybody else about it. If I know non-negotiable my kid has therapy on Tuesdays between whatever hours and whatever hours, and I need to be there. And that's a non-negotiable. Then on the audition form, I'm going to say I'm unavailable on Tuesdays from so-and-so to so-and-so, you no know? So, yeah. So as a parent, you know, again, that goes back to what I was saying, you know, to other parents, be encouraged, you know, and Hey, it may keep you out of that job, but that's all right. Yeah. I mean, I, I know it's easier for me to say too, you know, but other work will come. Other forms of work will come. You know, if again, if that in connection to your kids is a non-negotiable without you having to say, hey, I'm a parent, they don't have to know like the details of what that conflict is. But whatever commitment it is that you have to your family, that's a non-negotiable. Just like, yo, I'm unavailable on Tuesdays. Boom, boom, boom. The song. So if you know that's non-negotiable and then let the chips, you know, fall where they may. My oh, hand, so I'm in a different position because I'm not I'm not going to auditions or like being looking to be hired by other companies. <laughs> I definitely don't have time for that. <laughs> but um, so out of hand is run by three women. We sort we all you know sit at the the top tier. So we have me as the artistic director, uh, Aaron Parker as the managing director, and then Adria Kitchens is our director of equity and activism, which we've made like a you know third job on the direct on the same director's level because of the we work in social justice and we realize that that was just import as important for us as art or business. And we needed all three of those. And it just so happens that all three of us are moms. And so for us, it's like, we sort of, you know, we schedule our whole lives around, around being parents. And uh, so, I mean, I think that that's just so much a part of what we do. And, you know, Precious, if you are still <laughs> listening to this precious will probably laugh because when she first came to work at out of hand it's i mean we're a little on the weird side in that i'm like i don't unless we are doing an event in the evening or on the weekend i don't i don't i don't answer you <laughs> like none of us answer anybody on the in the evening or on the weekend because we're with our families because we're like you know we're prioritizing that so and then when we do have events then we're just still trying to train adria in this because she is a workaholic and bless her she just she works and works and works but Aaron and I are very much like if I have to work an event in the evening or on the weekend I'm gonna try to take off an hour during the day because I, you know like I want this all to balance out and I think we were all so excited to learn um, earlier this year when we hired Marlon Burnley to be our associate artistic director we didn't know until we had hired him I don't think that he, is, I think we knew he was a dad, but we didn't know that he is the primary caregiver, kind of the more like a stay at home parent um, for his son, Augie. And we were like, that is the coolest thing that like, that is exactly who fits on our staff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm really hearing is know your non-negotiables that kind of in my head also translate to drawing your boundaries. What about self-care? Cause I feel as if being at the theater for four to five hours. And then on those days we have rehearsal for eight hours and then you come home and depending on what age your kids are, you either have little ones who want to talk to you, who want to interact with you, or you have maybe the teenager that's in their room chilling, but you want to talk to them. What does self-care look like for you all? And how do you express it to your <laughs> other parents and like, y'all need to get that self-care too? During a show, self-care? In the car. Yes, yes. Um, Parents gotta take care of themselves during a show. Yo. Uh honestly, Listen, Laurel said it in the honestly, chat. Self-care is hard. <laughs> Self-care is what you do in the dressing room when nobody else is in there during show. That's just the truth. Um, no. Um, yeah, this is 
<laughs> I have asked the million dollar question. I, I mean, <sighs> I mean, I can give it as the, I don't, I don't know. Y'all don't get me started. I can tell you all the stuff that went wrong with me trying to implement self care when I was in the middle of the show. Because um, when I when our babies were little, I was walking the door and Naima would just be like, "Here, hand me the babies," because I'm like, "I get it. You've been home with them all day. They drove you up the wall." Um, I, one thing that, oh gosh, it's, t it's tough. It's hard y'all because I feel guilty if I come home and need to take like time to decompress or something. You know what I'm saying? Like once I walk in the door, it's hard for me because if my babies ain't seen me all day, it's tough to walk in the door. But like, okay, now daddy needs about 30 minutes to an hour to decompress. Like that ain't happening. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, y'all. I don't know. Maybe I haven't tried this. Maybe it looks like, hey, every day after rehearsal, I just need to go to this coffee shop and sit for 30 minutes to decompress before I head home. I haven't tried that. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a nut. So um, self-care. OK. It takes me a minute to to come down to come mm -hmm. down when I'm leaving rehearsal or it takes me a minute to slip back into the reality of you're on earth and you are a person, not the person in the role. Like it takes me, it takes me about 30 minutes to slip back into the reality of the fallacy of my dry reality from rehearsing or from doing a show, it takes me about 30 minutes. And that's usually on my drive home. And then Eugene is different from me. He has little kids and I have big kids. Um, and it's been a long time since I had little kids. So self-care is easier for me because I can just threaten people to take iPhone, leave me alone, or I'm gonna turn your phone off, that, that type of thing. He can't do that yet. So, Self-care is a little bit more possible for me. Um, I can get an hour of peace um, more so after rehearsals, late at night, maybe 2 a.m. Um, yeah, that's when it has to happen. Um, I have teenagers, so they beg and they want things and they, you know, they want to ask you questions and they want... You know, they want clothes and things like that. So they want your attention when they want it. So self-care, self-care can only happen during odd hours or, you know, it can't be conventional. You have to be flexible with your, even with your self-care when you're in theater. I, I've noticed something about theater. Things happen at odd hours during theater. Know that people, things happen at odd breakfast will maybe happen at 4 a.m. or maybe 9.30, or maybe dinner might happen at 2 p.m. That that type of thing, your self-care may occur at 3.30 a.m. So you may have to shuffle things. You don't live a conventional life, maybe. You may get used to things happening at different hours than other people. And that may be something you have to accept in the world of theater as a parent. So there you have it. I mean, so, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm sorry, Mario, you might want to jump in that too. But I just thought of one real quick. I don't know, maybe I'm just again, I'm throwing out ideas of self care that I never tried as an artist. But uh, I mean, Laura, uh, um, they said it in the chat that like this is stuff that probably everybody, even non artists, deals with in terms of the transition work. But it, you know, the, the connection to it is yes, if you're playing a really heavy, you know, emotional role. So anyway, here's another idea that I never tried. Maybe it's Hey, on my lunch, I'm going to call to check and make sure everybody's alive and breathing, but I'm going to take the rest of the lunch just to not be on the phone with y'all. I love you all. <laughs> on my lunch break, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, if there's anything like urgent, urgent, we can talk about it and deal with it on that break. But if it has to do with like uniforms for the girls, for school, and that's something that can wait till I get home, I'd rather not talk about it on my lunch. You know, because I'm going to take the, that full hour just away from everything. I don't know. I'm throwing out stuff. I never tried, y'all. When you're in theater, you take the time, like, in between show. Like, you you, you get in, you get it in where you can fit it in, in theater. Because mm -hmm. you have odd breaks 
and so you it's not like I said it's non-conventional so you may have a matinee show and an evening show so you may have an hour and five minutes between, between shows between that you have quiet time in your car like that type of thing there's your self-care so that it's not conventional so you take it where you can i'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and admit that i've had a a really crazy year i think i can probably speak for i mean probably that's true for everyone it's 2020 yeah. was you know the <laughs> hardest self-care um, and, uh, you know, everybody had a different version of, of the pandemic. And my version was that at the same time, my company took off our annual budget more than doubled in a year. And we, uh, appeared in the New York times four times in one year. And at the same time that all of that was happening, I, my husband and I tried to adopt a 10 year old foster child. She's our, the third foster child we've had. And, and we had her for six months while there was no school. And she's like, in you know, we had to be her special education teachers. Um, and she's got severe behavioral uh, issues. And I mean, we were just exhausted every, every minute of, of every day. And the one self-care thing that I did, <laughs> I'm really proud of doing it, that I still do, is that at some point I just laid down the law and I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to take this dance class for one hour twice a week in my bedroom with the door closed. And that's going to sustain me. That is, And I, I, I've been doing this dance class twice a week in my bedroom <laughs> because, of course, it's on Zoom, um, you know, since the beginning of the shutdown. And, and like that, that is my self-care. That is the thing that keeps me going. <laughs> wow. Great. Great. So what I'm hearing is you just have to find it when you can. And hopefully you can find it. And hope you don't take anybody off the process. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we are at the end of our time. And look, y'all are parents. Y'all have little ones or older ones you have to tend to. And so I want to be respectful of that. Are there any things y'all want to pop out in these like last couple of seconds before I close this out for the evening? I just want to say kudos to you, Amanda. This is this is amazing. This is really cool. Uh, and really like kudos to you for that last question about self-care because even yes. though we all were like, well, I kind of don't get it, it makes us think about it and remember yeah. the importance of it and and try to figure out how we can implement that. So really, really good stuff, Amanda. Kudos to Thank you Press also, because me coming up, uh, I've been a, I've been a parent for 27 years now. There was never any forums or anything other theater parents that I could turn to and look to for advice or anything like this. So kudos to you all for having something like this for people who aren't parents, who will become parents or young parents. To, to have something like this. Thank you to Actors Express for having this resource and tool for, for young parents or people to turn to, to have something, to throw out ideas, to get ideas, to, to just put thinking minds together. This is a wonderful, wonderful tool and resource. So thank you. Ditto what Mahalia and Eugene said. <laughs> Yes. Well, I want to say thank you all so much for giving me your time, Actors Express your time, and then also sharing your stories with everyone. It has been insightful. I definitely have. We're writing down these ideas from all of the panels over the course of these five weeks. So it's something that we have concrete evidence of, but also through the internet so we can take it and figure out how we can implement this into our structure. So thank you all for lending your voice to this conversation. Um, everybody who's watching, join us next week for Colors of the Industry. Design doesn't come from just the Europeans.